Hey everybody from the Peterson Automotive Museum. Welcome to Justice Brothers. I'm Ed Justice Jr. and I'm gonna give you a tour of our collection. I'm gonna highlight a few cars in our collection as we go through and let's start with this one because this one's very special to me. Probably if I had to get rid of everything, this would probably be the car I'd keep, to be quite honest. It's called the Charlie Allen Special and this was the first midget designed and built by Frank Curtis, the famous designer of the Curtis Craft Midget. This is not technically a Curtis Craft Midget, this is a Curtis Midget because he didn't start the company Curtis Craft till after World War II. And this car is actually built in 1939, pre-World War II. It was built in South Central Los Angeles, down on South San Pedro, in one half of an upholstery shop. And it was also used in a movie called The Big Wheel. And in that film, the famous actor from days gone by, Mickey Rooney drove this car on his way to becoming an Indianapolis 500 racer. Very special car, it's frame rail construction. It's got an Offenhauser motor in it. And uh, again, it's my favorite car. Frank Curtis was a very good friend of our family. My uncle Zeke Justice was his first employee at Curtis Craft after the war. And my dad worked there too. So this just has such very strong family ties. Based on our family history with the midget, and midget racing. We have the largest collection of midgets in the country, in fact, probably the world, and these are just a few of them. Many of these cars ran historic races. This car won the Riverside 500, which was in 1958, the first big weekend at Riverside International Raceway. Yeah, they did run midgets on Riverside one time, and this car won the race. Continuing on here, there's more midgets, midgets everywhere. And then we have this quarter midget. This was actually the first Frank Curtis quarter midget. It won the first quarter midget championship. This is the trophy for it that, uh, that year. And uh, the later Curtis Craft midget, which we will see probably in a little bit, had a different body style. Here's a frame rail that's powered by a Harley V-Twin. Yeah, they did actually run Harley motors and midgets. In fact, pre-war, they ran all sorts of motors in them. After the war, it was pretty much V8-60, the small 60 uh, Ford flathead, or the Offenhauser. If you had the money and you were really one of a top dog, you ran the Offenhauser, the four-cylinder midget Offenhauser engine. Uh, those who didn't have money, and some of them included people like Vic Edelbrock Sr., who ran a Ford V8-60, uh, ran it very well. A lot of people didn't realize he was running nitro in the fuel, and that's uh, why the car ran so well. But anyway, we go on to all the different other midgets, and of course, you cannot miss our stock car hanging on the wall. And the driver, Edward Lawrence James, is actually the three brothers. Edward, my dad, Lawrence, my uncle Zeke, who was known more by Zeke, and James, my uncle Gus, whose middle name was Russell, Russ, Gus, and uh, I love that stock car. Our collection is really a tribute to the Justice Brothers, my dad and my uncles, and American Racing. And it also includes a number of the cars that we've sponsored over the years. Uh, this right here is a 1979 Jawa Speedway motorcycle, Mike Bass, famous American rider, won his seventh U.S. title on this motorcycle. This is right off the track, the way that he finished it when he won that title, and it's been on display here ever since. Down here, this is another unique motorcycle. This car, uh, motorcycle actually was imported by a good friend of ours, Bill Cody, who was the Jawa importer to the U.S. This is a 1983 Jawa Ice motorcycle, and it's the only one in the U.S. that I know of. It's never been fired. This is a brand new motorcycle, 1983, never started. And it has spikes on the tires because in Eastern Europe, they ran these things. And there's one thing that when you feel the spike, 
They're not sharp, they're razor sharp. And if you fell down and you had three competitors behind you because they'd run four to a race, you hope that none of them would even come close to you because this thing is unbelievable. Hard to believe that they actually race a motorcycle like this, but they did and they do. And a lot of people think of Mel Gibson and Mad Max when they see this thing, but this is for real right here. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to cover everything in the collection, and I think you can see why, but we're gonna highlight different cars again. This car, 1983 world champion, top fuel world champion, NHRA uh, championship car, driven by Gary Beck, owned by Larry Miner. Uh, we sponsored the Larry Miner racing team for 20 years. Larry, great guy, very good friend to this day. Gary Beck was here the other day, in fact, visited his car, looked at it. Very, very historically significant car from a different era of drag racing. In the back there is the Ed McCulloch Miller High Life Funny Car. And that car won the Indian Nationals a, a few times. And uh, again, we sponsored that car, very significant. Uh, the two cars that were primary cars out of the movie Driven, uh, in my opinion, clearly the worst racing film ever made. And I know there's some of you out there that actually like the film and that's great, okay? I own the car, so I'll take it either way. We go on into the other cars, America's first compact car, an American Austin. Uh, they actually call that a sedan, even though it's a two-door coupe. But you know, these marketing guys, you know how they are. This is a 1930 first year of manufacture. They went bankrupt by 1934. They re-came back out as a Bantam, which maybe some of you might know. And they ran Bantams from 35 to 40. And it's a four cylinder, 11 horsepower. Yeah, that's right. I heard the one guy say, my lawnmower has more horsepower than that. And you're right. Uh, it's this little thing is something else. You better get along with whoever's riding with you because you're sitting on top of each other in that, that uh, car. So, and then the uh, significant piece, this is a nose and tail off the 1956 Indy 500 winner that Pat Flaherty drove to Victory Lane at Indianapolis 500. Interesting story, don't have time to tell you how I ended up with it and the whole deal behind it, but it's really something else. It's this type of stuff that happens when you collect the stuff, uh, like people like us, you know, we're car people, right? I promise you, we would talk about a few special cars in our collection. This is one. This is a 1972 914. I'll answer the question in your mind right now. It's a four cylinder, it's not the six. It took everything I had to be able to afford this car in 1972 when I bought it. I put a significant amount of money down on the car and then my mom and dad loaned me a little bit to make up the difference, which I was on the hook to pay them back for. And my last payment to my mom to pay this car off was giving her my Konica Auto S2 camera, which was my first real camera. I've owned this car ever since 1972. It was the first Porsche I ever bought. It was the car that I was driving when my wife and I met. And this is the car that we dated in. And to be quite honest, she's the only reason I still own this car, surprisingly enough. When we were first married, and we didn't have a lot of money. I wanted to sell the car. I could have sold it for about $3,500. And that would have meant a big change in our life. We didn't have that much money. And my wife said, no, Ed, don't sell the car. We'll be all right. And on top of it, I was paying $25 a month for an extra stall at the apartment we were living at, which was another irritation to me. Well, long story short, I took my wife's advice we didn't sell the car, and here it is still to this day. I put over 100,000 miles on the car. I used to take this to all my photo shoots when I was working for the magazines, shooting drag racing and, and the features and car profiles and all that type of stuff. It's a perfect car for hauling gear because it's got a front and a rear trunk. So this is a great photographer's car. 
and uh, the car means a lot to me. It's really special. Ground zero for me with the Porsche brand. It just so happens that there are two other cars I want to point out right past this portion I was just talking about. This is a Curtis Roadster Midget. It was built in the late 1950s. This is one of six that Frank Curtis produced. Very rare car. I think all six survived to this day. Uh, and this is one of them. Very special. It was taking the Frank Curtis Roadster mentality from Indianapolis, putting it in a midget. The cars actually ran very well. The drivers seem to like the standard ones better. And then we move over to this car. This is my father's favorite car. It's a 1932 Ford Phaeton. The reason why I bring this car up is this was the first Ford flathead that was delivered to the state of California. It was given to Louis B. Mayer of Metro Golden Mayer, MGM Studios by Henry Ford. Documented people in the Ford world know about this car. After Louis Mayer got through driving it, it went to the transportation department in, uh, at the studio. They used it in a number of uh, productions. Like the studios do, after a certain point, they'll have an auction to get rid of props and cars and stuff. They just accumulate this stuff, they run out of room. This car went to auction, a young guy bought it that knew what it was. He started to restore it, ran out of money, and it was bought by a friend of my dad's, George Bistain, who finished the restoration, put a Chevy in it, yeah, unfortunately got rid of that original Ford flathead and modernized it with the modern suspension, tilt wheel, and all that stuff that they do for a hot rod. And uh, we bought it from George several years ago, but it's still the body, the car lineage was the original Ford flathead in the state of California. One of the things that we have in our collection are a lot of personal items uh, over the years from our racing and all that. And these three images are just three that I can use an as an example. Uh, this is my dad in Glendale, California. He's right here working on building the Curtis Midgets. This is my uncle Zeke, uh, whose given name again was Lawrence, but he was nicknamed Zeke when he was a youth. And this is down uh, at Colorado and Adams, which was a uh, uh, very, very early Curtis location. The building doesn't exist anymore. The building where this picture was taken does exist. It's over on, uh, on the uh, west side of Glendale. Uh, and then this is my uncle Gus, who was paralyzed in an automobile accident at 21 years of age from the waist down. And that's at the third Southern 500 at Darlington uh, Raceway in Darlington, South Carolina. So we have a lot of this type of stuff. These doors, when my, my dad and uncle worked at Curtis Craft during the day, at night and on the weekends, they operated their Justice Brothers race car repair and fabrication shop. You see, after the war, GIs had a lot of money. They came out of the war, they hadn't spent it, and they were getting paid by the U.S. government to fight this war. And uh, midget auto racing was the biggest form of racing after World War II. Uh, it was everywhere. And so if you wanted a Curtis midget, the waiting list was a long time to get a finished car. But if you would buy one in a kit form and you put it together, you could get it right away. Problem is a lot of people bought them in kit form and they didn't know how to put it together. So it opened up the opportunity for guys like my dad and my uncle on the nights and weekends to put together kits. Hey, these are the same guys that are building the cars during the day. They can build it for you at night. And so that's where the Justice Brothers race car repair and fabrication came about. I get a lot of people here that are into cars and some that say they are, but they really aren't. Okay, it's okay, I get it. 
uh, I'm not really into a lot of other things too that I tell people I'm into, so I get it. But every once in a while, that person, when they come here, all of a sudden they turn the corner and they see this and they go, oh my gosh, you own Princess Vespa's Mercedes from the movie Spaceballs from the late 1980s? And I go, yeah, it's, that's it right there. Oh, here's my phone. Get a picture of me with it. I got it, my friends are not gonna believe this. This movie has a cult following that I never realized when we acquired the car from our friend Dean Jeffries, who built the Monkey Mobile. He built the original Green Hornet Black Beauty car. He built the trolley and who framed Roger Rabbit. He was a stunt man, just an amazing guy. Took pearl paints to Indianapolis in the uh, 50s. He, uh, he did the first, some say the first outlaw Porsche with his 356. Ah, I'll leave that up to somebody else to figure that out. But it was a famous car, it was on the cover of Rod and Custom magazine. Uh, and so anyway, yes, this is Princess Vespa's Mercedes hovercraft from the movie Spaceballs. Ludicrous speed. And, uh, you know, may the Schwartz be with you. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't get to see a picture of my mom and dad. I know a lot of people have a picture of your mom and dad, maybe in your office. I get it. Uh, this is a life-size eight by 10, literally eight feet by 10 feet. Uh, and this is my dad, this is my mom, my uncle Gus, and my uncle Zeke. This was shot in Glendale, California. This was the midget that they built for themselves. They sold, they raced it one time at Gilmore Stadium. They sold it and made $2,500 profit, which was part of the seed money to get us into the oil additive business. Uh, additives, lubricants, and cleaners that Justice Brothers Incorporated makes. My uh, Uncle Gus was already paralyzed from the waist down. So you might ask, well, how is he able to stand? Well, back in that era, they had what they called leg braces, and they were lockable. That's why he's holding on to the car. Uh, President Roosevelt used leg braces with his polio. Uh, and so if he let go of the car, he would all over. So for the photograph, and this was, it, this was thought to be a way to get your ability to be more mobile. If he wasn't holding onto the car, you'd have to have crutches. Uh, it was very painful. It was a crazy idea really by today's standards, and that's why you don't see him anymore. And really, uh, once my Uncle Gus admitted to himself in his mind that this was his life, was, you know, as a paraplegic, and he accepted that fact, he actually, his life got better, he told me. Uh, he was in denial at this point in his life. And so anyway, this picture is a capturing of that. My uncle Zeke, of course, they lived in this house in the background. My mom and dad had just been married and uh, my mom was actually pregnant in this picture and they didn't know it.